All right, so a few words about SOSV. You know, there's no free lunch, you've got a bit of propaganda. Uh, <laughs> so the often, the, even though it's not very well known, because most of, mostly our operations in those uh, particular uh, hardware and life science areas are known, uh, still pretty big fund, like about 625 million the management, so over 800 startups invested. Uh, one of the most active in the early stage, uh, uh, according to Crunchbase. And uh, mostly we invest in the pre-seed, uh, pre-product stage, and then we follow on at the, the later stages. So that, that's kind of our, our, our model. Uh, we have offices all around the world. I used to be based in the Shenzhen office for about four years. I was in Asia for well, way too long, uh, close to 20 years, across Japan, China, Korea. And uh, now based in Paris, uh, we have a pretty big office also in San Francisco, and an office in London focused on biotech. Um, so we like to call ourselves hands-on capital, because uh, those are our labs. So um, you can see a biotech lab in San Francisco and London, electronics lab in uh, Shenzhen, right in the middle of the electronics market. Uh, we have experts in-house in our Shenzhen <laughs> office, we have about 30 people helping with design, electronics, robotics, sourcing, manufacturing, marketing, strategy. And we're in the middle of very critical ecosystems for, for the particular sectors we cover. Some of our portfolio companies, some of them you might, some of them you might have heard of, maybe uh, Jump Bikes, um, recently acquired by Uber. Uh, we're the lead investor uh, in, uh, the, since the, the early times, and um, actually that did pretty well in addition with the Uber IPO. Um, we have a few other up and coming companies. This is a Makeblog, the STEM robotics company, uh, valued close to $400 million uh, from Shenzhen and selling all around the world. We're one of the leaders in the clean food, like food in the lab movement. Uh, investors in Memphis Meats and a few others in that sector. Uh, we also have some activity in crypto with BitMEX. If some of you have a crypto that they bought uh, uh, like a long time ago, that's then you're doing well. Otherwise, you can still trade futures on BitMEX and uh, on the bet on the future of crypto. They're doing actually really, really well. They're the largest exchange uh, for crypto derivatives and crypto volume. Uh, Phone Labs, GetAround, uh, also companies. Uh, those are more recent companies in the hardware branch to just show the variety of things we do. Uh, this is a brain stimulation device to treat depression, so it's competing with pharma. Uh, this is a, a portable diagnostic <coughs> for blood. Uh, it's not Theranos. Uh, this is a magnetic <laughs> robot. Uh, this is an inspection robot. Robot needs to do a lot of uh, repetitive, dull, dirty tasks, and this is one of them. Um, this is a uh, uh, no, we didn't invest in Stevie Wonder. It's just a user of the product, <laughs> and uh, that's a device that can do personalized audio by analyzing your hearing. Uh, a company called Neura, also doing very, very well. So to summarize, we're a global early stage fund, about 600 million dollar capital. Uh, latest fund we're raising is 250. We're really close to 18. It's been announced. Uh, we do hands-on on deep tech, hardware, life science. Invest in over 800 startups, 150 a year. About a third in hardware, third life science, third uh, software models, and uh, start from pre-seed. So that's us. Now, what is deep tech? Uh, so when I saw, I, <coughs> when you registered, you had a question like, what's your experience with deep tech? I realize many of you actually have a lot of experience with deep tech, so I'm going to venture some definitions and we'll have time to discuss about uh, what you think about the definition during the panel as well. So deep tech, so why deep tech first? Uh, should, should it be called hard tech, emerging tech, frontier tech, future tech? I don't know. Uh, generally, uh, pretty flexible definition. I know one when I see one. It's like with censorship. Um, and uh, basically, it's not a simple website. Not simple app, generally involves science and engineering, and often has a tangible component. Another way to look at it is that it's a mix of tech, computer science, and something else, with some tech risk, with longer time frames, and requiring more capital, more or less. Why bother with that if it's so complicated? Because, well, first it connects the physical and digital world. There's just so much you can do with an app without acting on the physical world. There's real needs in all industries and it's also underfunded, so this means there's many opportunities. So the hypothesis we have is that basically what's happening today in the car industry is basically a front runner of what's gonna happen in many industries being reinvented with physical and tangible technologies. Um, and what used to take 20 years, um, such as uh, Amazon to become bigger than Walmart, now is taking less and less time uh, for a new player to overtake an incumbent. Uh, so Tesla is another example, 
you can bigger than GM in just about 14 years. Uh, Uber became bigger than any of those guys in about 10. And uh, I don't know if that can be counted as a digital disruptor, but if some of you have followed the IPO of Luckin Coffee from China, the Chinese Starbucks, this company is two years old. 2,000 stores in China already. So there's waves of it. Also realizing that there's waves of innovation. You start with something very general, maybe like kind of average low tech, and then gradually become more and more high tech, um, such as Fitbit, going to specialized trackers for all sorts of like sports or sleep or other things, and eventually going, now entering a phase where you have even devices that don't just track but actually heal you, like fully closing the loop of uh, the tracking of the therapy and competing with pharmaceuticals and others. Uh, some examples from industry, uh, John Deere acquired a company called Blue River Technologies, that's a weeding technology company. Uh, basically computer vision plus, uh, you can see here's like a hyperspectral imaging of plants, um, and uh, they paid $300 million for it. That's a tractor company buying an AI company. Neutrogena, um, about this uh, device company that helps treat acne, so maybe your <coughs> acne problems are far away. Uh, that uh, some people still suffer, and this is a, a way for a company like J&J to enter a sector uh, that's dominated by pharma and uh, with a device. And that's, uh, that's sold about like $40, uh, that has a few chargers, use, uses uh, frequencies of light to treat the skin. And that, you, that's a startup in which they invested at the Series B and eventually acquired. <coughs> um, so the risk with deep tech is a mix, tech, market, execution risk. Um, but there's also upsides uh, that, yes, it's difficult, but once you get there, then uh, it's difficult to catch up with you because you have walls, you have moats, and the question is, are you actually really digging a moat or, uh, or, or big, building a wall in which you can uh, you know, taunt your opponents, or are you digging your own grave, building technology nobody cares about, uh, has no market? Uh, in deep tech, uh, there's been some major failures. Uh, those are almost all in the past mm -hmm. two years. Um, light, maybe you know some of you, uh, some of those. Lightro uh, is a light field camera. I'm still not quite sure what it's used for, <laughs> but they raised 200 million dollars for it, and they didn't really find market. Meta is an AR company. Jibo was trying to do a home companion robot. Also, not quite sure what it was used for, but Alexa is doing it better for. But like a tenth of the price. <laughs> Rethink Robotics, Collaborate Robot, Pioneer. Pioneers get the arrows. Um, Airware, a B2B drone company, uh, built very Silicon Valley style, eventually got acquired by the French competitor uh, that's uh, more financially optimized. Uh, and the latest casualty, uh, or the world kill, you could say, uh, is Anki, um, AI, a robotics company that uh, didn't really want to, build, to be a toy company, but built toys, so that didn't quite work, apparently, but uh, had some really interesting technology. Um, just those, those like, there's like six companies, that's about a billion dollars. No, that's something. Fortunately, some are doing well. Uh, there's a number of unicorns in deep tech or hardware. B, uh, many, many of them are B2B. A few are uh, highlighted in red, so it's really small, but uh, you can see the slide later. Uh, but you can see Form Labs, Desktop Metal, uh, Zoom Pizzas, Pizza Robot. Uh, and a number of others uh, here. Uh, B2B tends to dominate. Uh, some are, have been really capital efficient. And uh, the old trends that media keeps talking about, like wearables, drones, and 3D printing, actually achieve also some unicorns. So you know, things are actually working when we go past the casualties. SoftBank is also a pretty active investor in deep tech. You can see uh, GM Cruise, View, Neuro, Zoom, Plenty is an ag tech uh, vertical farming company. Light and a uh, number of others, and most of those are B2B. So the good news on deep tech is that there's more and more startups, there's more and more investment, but the bad news is that it's still uh, a little bit misunderstood and uh, there's a number of funding gaps, particularly at the early stage. So how do we invest in deep tech? We have a pretty particular spot because we invest before the product is ready. We invest at a very early prototype stage and we take the teams, uh, in the case of hardware, to Shenzhen so that they can take advantage of the supply chain and the ecosystem to iterate faster on prototypes and then get to market uh, more, more efficiently. But 
I've shared some of our learnings over the past few years around deal flow, around some biases that we notice, uh, we notice in ourselves, and uh, some of the de-risking, de-risking and milestones that are specific to deep tech that uh, we also looked into. So the problem we have when we invest at such early stage that we basically free trend. There's no identifiable trend. Uh, if you tell me about a trend that's in the media, it's too late for us, but probably about three to five years. Um, if it's already hot, it's too late. Uh, so we need to see the future in some way and make bets uh, on the future. Uh, the signals we get, because uh, I think even, uh, even science fiction writers generally get it wrong, um, the signals we get is the flow of applicants that give us an idea of what's going on, what new technologies are made available uh, for new applications. So we see probably a couple thousand applicants a year. And um, the needs of corporates we're connected to is also a good indicator of what could have a market. So three biases uh, that uh, I encourage you to avoid uh, if you go into deep tech as the sci-fi bias, the ugly duckling, and the makeup bias. Uh, Try to find interesting names for those. But the sci-fi bias is, uh, so I was at Viva Tech last week in, uh, in Paris, and those guys were everywhere. They're everywhere all the time, but I'm still not sure it's a good business to make such robot and such expensive iPad holder. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, it, it was a very cool idea 10 years ago, but I think it also suffered from the sci-fi bias then. Uh, this is an example of a company we invested in a few years back, and we thought, wow, that's so futuristic, that's so cool. It's uh, a printer for fabric using, I'll try to get this right, um, so liquid polymers, 20,000 volt electric field to basically guide the polymer fibers to a shape and then printing fabric there, just out of almost thin air. It's like a crazy machine. Very you know, high voltage, so can you imagine? Uh, it actually did print things, but uh, obviously to reach consumer prices uh, didn't quite work. So they tried to find businesses, op business opportunities, they tried to find opportunities for B2B pil uh, pivots, because technology came from medical, like, um, um, but uh, eventually didn't find it. So we realized that anytime we see a technology and we're like, this is so cool, but well, we'll figure out the market later, Jimmy, not a good sign. Uh, here's another example. This one survived. I'll tell you how. Um, this is a modular robot. Very cool, very cute. This is the type of work that's done in research labs in MIT, in EPFL, in Switzerland. Very complicated. In, uh, I visited the EPFL to do two modules, it was costing them about 3,000 euros for two. Um, I was like, what, what are you going to use that for? I said, oh, I don't know. Like, Rescue snake robot, <laughs> modular furnitures for elderly. Like, okay, so one joint, 3,000 euros for a modular table. Okay. Um, and uh, this, this was Chinese team from uh, Beijing University, and they managed to get the price of this complete set for about, to about $500. And we're like, but what is it? Is it is the toy? Is the Education tool? Is it it's something useful? Is it a like, robot for industry or what? They tried Kickstarter, didn't quite work. Eventually, some time passed, and we like, I uh, think that those guys are, might not survive, but they, may, they, they got some funding, because in China, if you're a good team, good technology, you can find funding risen fairly easily. And a couple of years later, um, it turns out that uh, they were still kicking. So I asked them, okay, what's the business now? So, uh, are you selling $500? robots to families? They say, oh, no, no, we totally stopped that. Uh, now we sell $50,000 packages to schools. I said, how do you sell $50,000 packages to schools? I said, well, because they have all those robotics education classes and they use uh, Lego Mindstorms. But with Lego, 90% of the time you're just assembling Lego, doing 3D puzzle, and then you do 10% of your time robotics education. With our thing, it's very quick to clip. So you can do 90% robotics education just 10% assembly or less. So the teachers and the, the students love it. And so now they're doing very well. 30 people doing well. So this guy's happy. Um, but today in terms of robotics, we try to avoid the humanoid, futuristic, metropolis looking things. And uh, we focus on boring and viable robots, such as those guys. These guys, uh, this one uh, is inventory robot. This one cleans uh, the outdoors. This one cleans the windows. This one cleans 
the indoors, we have kind of obsession with killing. <laughs> and <laughs> this one is an inspection. <laughs> inspection of tires and all sorts of other things. So modular inspection robot. Um, it's from some US, Canada, China, China, Canada. So futuristic, cool, but high risk. And we realize that often something that's spectacular uh, is quite orthogonal with something that's viable. Economy. Bias 2, the ugly duckling. So that's the, basically the robot that, or the, not the necessarily the robot, but the product that looks unpolished because it's still very lab looking. And it scares a lot of investors because they feel that nothing is ready. Well, sometimes you just put a pretty box on it and then suddenly, oh, it's like it's done. So that was the example of that company. You can see that the prototype, they were <coughs> the type of software they were doing for supermarket inventory it was a team from Willow Garage, some of you might, might know. Oh, I need to go a lot faster than I'm doing. Um, so this is the same with a pretty box three months later. And uh, they did a demo video. And three months later, th three months after that, they, they had a pilot uh, with a retail chain in the US and a uh, close funding. Another example of a not pretty looking thing. This one was in technology inspired. It's difficult to tell what this is doing, but kind of analyzing your hearing. Uh, the same technology used for babies to check if uh, they can hear when they're born, because they can't tell you. Um, and uh, one of the founders, uh, 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 ear surgeon. This is uh, the product uh, some time later. So you have to be able to see in the ugly duckling what will be the good looking product. And sometimes a very different shape because they were trying to do earbuds, but then they realized the, the space constraint was too high and they did a larger thing. Um, and you have to see not only the first product, but to see that it will